Good morning. I'm Nancy Creed, president of the Springfield Regional Chamber, and I am joined this morning with Megan LeMay, the Western Mass Regional Director for the Alzheimer's Association. Good morning, Megan, and thanks so much for joining me this morning for coffee. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So you were the Western Mass Regional Director for the Alzheimer's Association. Tell me a little bit about your organization and your role. Yeah, definitely. So the Alzheimer's Association does a lot of work in the community. Our mission is actually to eliminate Alzheimer's disease through the advancement of research and funding research, and also to provide care and support for those families currently coping with Alzheimer's or another dementia uh, within their family. And so we offer a lot of free programs and services to families who are coping with this. And we just want to also educate the public in general around Alzheimer's and dementia. And so I um, run a lot of the programs and organize the programs and services and outreach out here in Western Mass. How'd you get involved? So it's something I've always been passionate about and I am now, you know, really committed to the mission of reducing the stigma around Alzheimer's and dementia, because I think there still is so much stigma around this disease. Um, people tend to have some misconceptions and misunderstanding and fear around it. And so I think what's so important, you know, one of the many important things we want to do is really reduce that stigma and just try to um, help people understand that this is a common disease in the population. Millions of people are living with this disease. And we want to make our communities just more welcoming and inclusive for people living with a dementia. And speaking of that, I know um, the Alzheimer's Association does a lot of trainings and workshops to make customer friendly businesses to get folks in the business community to to recognize the signs um, and perhaps treat them a little bit differently than they would because they understand it. Can you talk to me about that and why? why it's important from a business perspective for us to get involved. Yes, absolutely. So what's been amazing is a movement that um, kind of popped up a few years ago now, the dementia friendly movement. And this is really a way to pull other businesses that maybe um, haven't been involved in or haven't thought much about Alzheimer's or dementia in the past. But um, we know that because, like I mentioned, millions of people in the U.S. are living with Alzheimer's. And it makes sense to make all spaces more dementia friendly. So meaning businesses too. So for example, banks, um, grocery stores, any type of um, business restaurants that serve customers with, who are living with a dementia or living with memory loss. And it makes sense to actually accommodate them and for, for people who work in those industries to understand how they can just be a little bit, maybe a little bit more patient or just adjust their customer service just a little bit to just be more inclusive and welcoming to people with dementia. So we offer trainings, just a one hour free trainings to businesses to just prepare their staff a little bit more for, you know, when someone walks in who maybe is struggling with something basic like counting out change, for example, that's something someone with dementia might forget how to do, which is a really basic skill. But um, they can still be served in that business. It doesn't mean, you know, you, want, you don't want to turn them away. You don't want to make it seem like they can't come back or at a restaurant, for example. You know, we can do small changes to just make it a more welcoming environment for them and to, to, to train staff on what is dementia. And you don't have to fear it. You can still serve those customers and do it even just a little bit, um, maybe a little bit more in a friendly way or just a little bit more patience. Um, or making it really simple for someone, for example. So maybe offering a little bit fewer options, asking them, you know, if you know what the person likes, if they're a, a regular, you can just kind of um, make it simpler for them so they can get through the transaction or be served in that business um, really smoothly. So just a little training can go a long way in, in serving customers who, who may be experiencing memory loss. And how would how would I know when a customer comes in that you know I I forget things all the time? But mm -hmm. how if I had a customer come in, how would I be able to tell the difference to be able to to react to them in a in a much more patient, compassionate way? Yeah, that's a good question. So sometimes you know, of course, people are not going to know. It depends if this is someone you've been serving 
over years. So if it's at a bank, for example, this customer has always been a customer and now you're seeing a change. Maybe they forgot your name and they used to know your name. You know, that it's a, it could be a simple warning sign like that. Um, or they're forgetting to do simple things with banking and you, they might need a little bit more assistance. So sometimes we don't know, but we just want to provide some help. And instead of the whole you know, point of dementia friendly is really to walk towards someone and support someone with dementia instead of just walking in the other direction and avoiding them that, you know, we want to help each other out a little bit more. And um, it, they might just need a little bit of extra help with the task or with figuring out how to pay um, something simple like that or at a restaurant you know just providing a suggestion of you know oh do you want this sandwich or this sandwich which makes it easier for someone to choose instead of looking at a menu that's overwhelming and someone with dementia might just they can't look at a menu with 40 items and be able to choose something that's that's going to be overwhelming for someone with dementia so making it a little bit more accessible, simple, simplifying for them, just like saying, you know, do you want the turkey or do you want the meatloaf? And just making it simple um, and making a suggestion like that can go a long way in making a more successful interaction. Sometimes it's just about um, making more dementia-friendly signage. So making sure you have clear signage in your, in your business or labeling restrooms more clearly um, things like that that's, that can be simple changes that just make it a little bit more accessible for people. And how is, um, I think you recently released a report that um, the pandemic has had a greater impact on um, dementia patients and Alzheimer's patients. What, what have you seen? Yeah, so it's been a really challenging year, of course, for everyone, but um, especially, yeah, for people with dementia, they were more likely to just experience even more isolation. So this can be just such an isolating disease anyway, because people tend to, their family or friends sometimes pull away a little bit, they're not sure what to do. Um, so it can be an isolating experience already. But because of the pandemic, you know, people just couldn't go to senior centers like they were, they couldn't go to their typical restaurant they might go to. Um, they couldn't do as much as they were before. So it's just been isolating. And the, we know that there's serious health impacts of isolation um, on older people and on everyone. But yeah, there's, there's poor health outcomes from isolation as well as, and we see faster cognitive decline when someone is isolated and isn't getting as much um, cognitive stimulation or um, social interaction as before, and they decline faster. Um, and because we know that there's certain things we can do to kind of slow the progress of this disease, which is keeping your brain active and exercise and things like that. So when people don't have that, they decline faster. And also, of course, people living in um, places where they might have just been more exposed to COVID as well. We saw increased, um, increased deaths from COVID itself as well. And you also, um have seen some racial disparities um, and so some socioeconomic disparities. Talk to me about what those are, because I'm not sure people necessarily make that connection. Yeah, so unfortunately in the United States, African Americans are about twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's disease compared to the white population in the US. And so this is something um, really significant and we just wanna do more work and outreach around to try to educate and reach more populations. And it can be so devastating. And we know that um, African-Americans are also just less likely to be diagnosed um, because of probably discrimination and prejudice in the healthcare system and a history of that. Um, and just the, his, the history of the stress around um, racism and discrimination in the US too, probably contributes to that health disparity as well. And so it's something that the Alzheimer's Association is taking really seriously and we're really trying to, we wanna combat these health disparities um, and try to make sure that we're doing really uh, calculated outreach and compassionate outreach to 
um, more diverse communities so that we can really try to um, work on this and, and improve it. And I would think this pandemic has hindered that outreach for your organization. How have you been able to kind of manage through this? Um, I'm also sure that you're, you've been impacted with fundraising. You usually have walks and other types of fundraising events. So how has the Alzheimer's Association, especially here in Western Mass, um, had to deal with that and kind of adjust? Yeah, so it's, yes, it's been difficult and it definitely has impacted our fundraising, you know, not being able to do uh, galas and our walk in person, which is usually a wonderful event every September where people get together in person and are able to walk and think about their loved ones that have passed with Alzheimer's or who are currently walking besides them with Alzheimer's and trying to fund the research around that. So we definitely missed out on a lot of those opportunities, but then also, of course, it impacts our outreach and our education. So, you know, we used to go out to all different senior centers, libraries, public spaces, um, businesses in person and do this education, um, really educating the public and caregivers about, about Alzheimer's and dementia. And now that was all switched to virtual. So, you know, we have been able to have some success in doing virtual presentations. So, you know, for some businesses, it's easier because they can just have their staff tune into a Zoom call for 45 minutes on um, dementia friendly practices and how to improve their um, outreach or how to improve their customer service for those living with dementia. Um, so for some, in some ways it's been easier for some people to access the virtual education programs and presentations, but in other ways, you know, we know we're not reaching as many older people who maybe struggle with technology um, or anyone who struggles with technology. And um, so that's been a struggle. And we have even our support groups, a lot, we do a lot of support groups for those living with Alzheimer's and um, <clears throat> for caregivers. And so those are now virtual. And some people love the virtual support groups. For some people, you know, it's easier. They don't have to get in their car and drive um, a half hour to a support group or something if they live somewhere a little bit further away. They can just tune in and get that connection with other caregivers. Or I run a support group um, for people with Alzheimer's and they love the virtual platform and love being able to connect and meet other people living with dementia in their community and to be able to share experiences and um, talk about how they get through the day, talk about their symptoms in a virtual setting is easier for them. They don't have to rely on a caregiver to drive them to a support group, for example. So for some people, it's been great. For others, it's a struggle. And, you know, they're really wanting to get back to in-person support groups and other supports. Have there been some lessons learned or best practices that you've seen that, that you will continue to implement when we move further into recovery? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I think we're going to continue this hybrid ap approach of definitely still offering virtual support groups and virtual education programs, even after we get back to more in-person programming as well. Because like I mentioned, you know, there's definitely definite benefits to to offering some virtual options um, for families. And you talk a bit about um, support groups. So who in your life has been the greatest support to get you to where you are today? Yeah, I would say um, my parents, I'm really lucky to have amazing parents and also um, just wonderful colleagues that I've worked with who have inspired me and who I've learned from and learn to be more outgoing, to talk to everyone, um, and to really learn how to interact with and support people living with dementia as well. Um, and I've learned that from my colleagues who are just the most kind and compassionate, um, wonderful people who really just care about um, making, ma making the lives better of those living with dementia and their families. So that's really um what I'm excited to do every day is to just do that outreach and support people. And I've got to ask you this. I heard that when you were getting your master's degree, um, you were a bus driver. Yes, I worked um, as a bus driver for the Pioneer Valley Transit Authority for five years. 
And I loved it, actually. It was great. And I love listening to podcasts while I drive and interacting with the public. And it was it was a great experience. Was there something you learned um, from that experience? Because that's a very, it's a very different but very similar experience to what you're doing now because you still need to interact with the public in a certain way. Um, so is there something, kind of a shining moment? Yeah, I guess just, I think for me, it's really all about the compassion for all, all human beings and every single person that you interact with. And um, so, for example, on our buses, we served a lot of people who were houseless or a home, homeless population. And so just seeing them on a daily basis and ride the buses and interact with them um, was a really positive experience and a good way to just get to know a different part of the population that, you know, I'm probably wasn't as familiar with when I was a teenager and before I started driving buses and got to know that population more and how people utilize public transit was, was really interesting. And um, taking all those experiences together, what would you tell the next generation of leaders? <laughs> I would say, um, again, it's really about kindness. And for me, creating a more just world and a more compassionate world for everyone to live in, um, where people can have a higher quality of life across the board and um, appreciate each other. So I think that's the, what our leaders should be doing. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate you and I appreciate the work that you're doing. And I very much appreciate you joining me this morning for coffee. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan. You have a great day. You too.